Today, the first Monday in October, which means it is the first day of the new session of the U.S. Supreme Court. And this session, it should be chock full of major cases on incredibly important issues. The justices, they won't be wasting any time either. The first potentially landmark arguments will be heard in some gay rights cases tomorrow, namely whether protections against sex discrimination also protect people on the basis of their sexual orientation. The Trump administration's arguing people can be fired for being LBGTQ. Now, the court will also hear major cases on guns, abortion, immigration, religious rights, and a lot more, many of which are now being reheard or were delayed until the court completed its most recent changes in roster and ideology. This is the first full season without Justice Anthony Kennedy, who was long considered the swing vote on the court. He was replaced by Brett Kavanaugh, who no one expects to be a swing vote on anything. Now, a lot of observers, they're now suggesting Chief Justice John Roberts might be the court's new swing vote. Roberts, he has gently pushed back on Trump's court bashing comments, and he has spoken about the need to keep the court as being seen as politically legitimate in these partisan times. But others, including the authors of an op-ed in today's Times, argue that Roberts is anything but a nonpartisan, saying Roberts is as partisan as they come and that he ought to worry about the court appearing to lose its legitimacy. For more, let's turn to Dahlia Lithwick. Dahlia is a contributing editor at Newsweek and a senior editor at Slate focused primarily on the intersection of the courts and politics. She's also the host of Slate's Legal Amicus podcast. And, and Di, I know everybody always says, oh, this is an important session, but you really can't overhype some of the stakes attached uh, to the cases that the court chose to take up here, especially with the new makeup of it. I think you're right, and I think you're exactly right to say almost every one of the cases you just mentioned was on the court's calendar list last January. In other words, they could have taken any of these cases for last spring, and they very deliberately chose not to do that, to hold them back until this term under the theory that the court could regain its footing after the bruising Kavanaugh hearing. Tomorrow's case, I mean, to me, I don't know. I don't know why I'm surprised by anything anymore. But that we're really going to legally consider being able to fire someone in America in 2019 because you're gay? That, that's really going to be put to a test. I, I'm surprised. I, I don't know. It seems like we're, we're going in, in a different direction that I thought was kind of asked and answered. Uh, you would think so. But in fact, actually, if you were gay in America, in only 22 states were you protected by state civil rights laws. So actually, in the majority of the states, uh, you could have been fired. Uh, and so we're not actually going backward at all. But I think you're quite right. This case goes to whether Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 gives you federal government statutory protection for being fired from being gay. Uh, and as you say, the employers, and in this case, the Trump administration, are saying that Title VII has nothing to do with this. They can have no protection from Title VII. And Di, when we talk immigration, to me, the, the case that's going to uh, crystallize where the court is, is DACA. Uh, do you believe we're going to finally get clarity? The president, uh, you know, obviously rose to prominence with the anti-immigration rhetoric, but even he knew um, how sensitive is certainly the optics were of kicking kids uh, out of the country that came here, um, as in many cases, even infants, but certainly as young children. Um, but it seems that he's going to leave it to uh, nine justices to make the decision for him. Yeah, this is another unbelievably consequential case. There are 800,000 dreamers, uh, as you know, kids who came to this country as children. Uh, they were protected under the Obama uh, DACA decision. All he said was, I'm going to deprioritize these kids uh, for deportation. I'm going to deport people who are a national security risk. And as you say, Donald Trump took office and simply rescinded it, said it's not good law anymore. All of these kids who believe that they were protected are now uh, apparently subject to deportation again. And you're quite right that the lower courts have all said Donald Trump can't do this. This comes, again, three consolidated cases. The question, I think, is going to be whether the Supreme Court is willing to do for the dreamers or to the dreamers what they did two years ago with the travel ban, the Hawaii case, where five justices were willing to take Donald Trump at his word that he was doing this for national security purposes. It had nothing to do with animus. But they're basically saying, or the president's argument was, that 
there was overreach by the part of the Obama administration, that they didn't have the authority through the executive branch to just do this. Meanwhile, uh, unless I've missed something, in the last three years, the president says he can basically do anything by executive fiat. So how's the court going to say, yeah, there's overreach, the president doesn't have those powers, but all these other things, unprecedented things in the last 36 months, yeah, you can do that. I, to me, I, I don't know, it just doesn't, it doesn't square. It's hard to get your head around it. I mean, I think that the argument the Trump administration and the Justice Department is making is that because it was lawless for Obama to do it in the first instance, it's not unlawful for Donald Trump to rescind it. Uh, more pointedly, uh, the issue here was really whether they did this under the Administrative Procedures Act. And that's this sort of boring law that says you can't do things for, quote, arbitrary and capricious reasons. So I think you're quite right. As a matter of executive power, he kind of wants to have his cake and eat it, too. He wants to say, I have all the executive power in the world, and Obama had none. But I think that the harder issue is, how does he defend making a decision that looks like it was sort of done recklessly on Twitter? You know, guns will obviously be on the docket. And what's really interesting is, to me, more than the specific subject of guns, they're going to really decide where sta states' rights get to start and stop. Um, and I'll be really curious if there's a consistency, because the court, at least the current court, seems really willing to let states make up their own rules, um, certainly uh, giving a lot of leeway and a lot of conservative issues. If now they're saying no states you can't go that far or no cities you can't go that far in putting in your own gun control policies, again, there's a subject of consistency as to where do state rights start and stop. Yeah, and it's today's case. Monday's case, by the way, was about whether states could take it upon themselves to just abolish the insanity defense. Uh, and, you know, whatever whatever uh, the federal constitution has to say about it, uh, be hanged. I think your point is a good one. And by the way, this is a, a through line throughout so many of these cases is, you know, punishing blue states and saying you can't do this and giving the red light to red states uh, that want to go way beyond uh, what the federal constitution would permit. On the subject of abortion, to me, Di, I, I thought it was telling and a little concerning, and you can probably get where my politics are on the subject, that it seems three years ago the court heard a case that seemed to settle this, and this court has decided to take it back up again in terms of um, what certain states, or at least whether or not doctors, uh, whether they're privileges or what uh, needs to basically be put in front of a woman, uh, if she wants to have the procedure, whether she wants to hear it or not. Two of these justices in their confirmation said Roe was settled law. Um, they basically promised, and I know senators like Collins, et cetera, that for them was a litmus test, that they were assured that these guys weren't going to undo Roe. Even if they literally don't, what does it tell you that they're choosing to hear these cases again when I thought it was settled law and this would be the definition of an activist court if they choose to revisit something that was recently addressed? Yeah, you're quite right. This is exactly the same. This admitted, admitting privileges law that Louisiana uh, is, is uh, trying to enact is identical to the one that the court struck down, the Texas law. Uh, in 2016. So only three years ago, Anthony Kennedy sided with the liberals on the court to say you cannot have pretextual laws like admitting privileges laws or clinic laws that you had to go you know, retrofit your clinics to be ambulatory surgical centers. And Justice Breyer, writing for five justices on the court, said this has nothing to do with maternal health and struck it down. The fact that Louisiana not only pushed forward with the exact same law, but that the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals said, well, this is a little different, so we're going to say it's constitutional when Louisiana do does it, is a total slap in the face, not just, as you say, to the idea of stare decisis and that precedent is binding on the lower courts. It's actually a slap in the face to the idea that when Roe gets overruled, it will be the Supreme Court that does it. This was the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals jumping ahead of itself and saying, we're going to go ahead and overrule Roe and overrule whole women's health. Daya, it will be very eventful, um, and you gave us a really good preview. I appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Well, late last night, the president did an about-face on Syria, and even some of his strongest supporters are saying it could lead to bloodshed for folks who fought on the front lines from us. I haven't got a guest on the other side of the break from the intelligence community. 
And he says not only would this be a tragic mistake, but we're already turning our backs on the people who have literally put their lives on the line for us.